and evidence, I was shocked to realize that it looks like one-fourth of the world will respond positively to the loud cry. Because in this process, you only have two groups. You have one measure of wheat and three measures of barley. That's much greater than I thought. This is a great harvest getting ready to come out. Can you see why the devil is getting very nervous? I mean, if one-fourth of the world responds positively to this message, it's a multitude without number. Are, are you beginning to understand the greatness of this message? Now, we, of course, God's going to teach us more. God's going to reveal more and more as we get to the end of time, more and more understanding of Daniel and Revelation. Sister White said, when we properly understand Daniel and Revelation, there will be a great revival. But we're in a process of a great revival, and we're in a process of learning more and more about Daniel and Revelation. But none of us can claim we understand everything. No, we're still learning. But the more we learn, the more grandiose we realize the plan of God is. It's a plan where there's a people that follow the Lamb, there's a plan that has a loud cry, and there's a great harvest. A group without number, a multitude without number. But do not hurt the oil or the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, and I heard the fourth beast say, now whose turn was it? It was God, Satan, God, and now whose turn is it? Satan's turn. Are you following me? Okay? He gets equal air time. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him with death and hell followed after him, with him. And the power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Uh-oh, I see two things here. Number one, power was given unto him, or it was given unto him, we could say. It's Satan writing. Does God ever have a name like death and hell? Would that be an appropriate name for God? <laughs> Never. He's life. And... Here, Satan is giving, given power to, to kill one-fourth part of the earth. Well, we say, well, that's, that's the other fourth. This is interesting. Could it, be the, could it be the barley he's killing? Or could it be the wheat that he's killing? You know what? If we keep reading, it will tell us. Let's keep reading. And when he opened the fifth seal and looked under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood upon them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants, that's all those people down on earth, the fellow servants, the rest of the, the, rest of the wheat, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. It takes a long time to kill a fourth part of the earth. The killing goes on and on and on and on and the blood of the saints, like the, saint, like the blood of Abel, under the altar, cries out unto the Lord, O oh Lord, how long until you avenge our blood? And the response from God is, just wait a little longer until the rest of them that are supposed to be killed are killed. That's what it says, right? I'm just reading quote verbatim. The patience of the saints takes a long time. And when it's all finished, White robes are given to every one of them. And this is the great multitude and all of the saved of all the ages that stand before the throne and wave the branches and they're dressed in white robes and they give glory to God. And then, of course, then you have the, the, the sixth seal and then you have the stars of heaven and the heavens were departed as a scroll and the kings of the earth and the great men and mighty men, they want to hide themselves in a cave. It is just before Jesus' coming. And just interestingly enough, John stops right there and in case you didn't understand what he was talking about, there's a biblical principle of interpretation of hermeneutics. It's called repeat and expand. And chapter 7 repeats and expands what you just finished reading about, the 144,000 and the great multitude. And then chapter 8, the seventh seal. Now, there's still a lot of things we're still reading and learning. There's a lot more for us to learn yet. But what I want to basically share with you now is you're right in the middle of this whole preparation process. The loud cry is follow, follows the ceiling. The red horse comes. The persecution comes. Most Seventh-day Adventists will leave. And those that are left will have to kind of organize themselves again. It'll still be Seventh-day Adventists, but they will, they will be a lot smaller group than they are now. Those that prepared for the crisis. And then all of God's children that have been anxiously waiting for the moment will feel convicted 
and they will join together in one people. And they will have to be faithful unto death. They will pay with their... The reason there's only two groups is either you, you obey God and die or you disobey God and try to save your life. But those that save their life will lose it and those that lose, give their life will save it. It's not a very nice time. It's worse than we could ever expect it. This fits along with what Sister White said. It is worse than we even could imagine. It's going to take a long time and God has to wait. Why, do, why does God wait on this to happen? Because He loves the people. And if like Moses, He can't translate them, then he, they have to go to the grave. And Jesus is coming very soon. So what happens? He tells Satan, you know what? I give you power to take their lives. And it goes on. Millions after millions after millions after millions. I've heard, I've heard rumors and, and theories of death camps everywhere. Have you heard those? Do I believe they exist? Absolutely. Why do I believe? How else is God, Satan going to do this unless he's preparing right now? I don't have to be thinking of conspiracies and theories. This is not a theory. We already know Satan is the greatest conspiracist in, in the planet. And does Satan want to kill God's people? Absolutely. That's his goal. Would he be preparing for that? For a work of death? Oh, yes, he is. The great controversy tells us that that's the case. So therefore, Satan is making his preparations, but he can't do anything without God's permission. And God is waiting on you and I because God cannot close this until you and I make our total commitment. And I would like to tell you that it's almost finished. He wants you. Maybe 144,000 is symbolic. Maybe it's symbolic because he invites all of us. Maybe it'll be more than 144,000. He wants all of us, doesn't he? Yes. But on the other hand, if we say no to God at the moment he invites us, what else can he do? Does he respect our choice and will? Yes. But you know that God is a God of love and more than anything else, he wants that message to spread out throughout the world and he wants to use you. But you and I need training. You and I need to fall under God's tutorship and be trained to be true soldiers and learning to follow the Lamb regardless of what happens, regardless of the cost. We will follow the Lamb. I love that song that says, I, I pledge my allegiance to the Lamb. Isn't that a beautiful pledge of allegiance? Regardless to the blood of the Lamb, I pledge my allegiance to the Lamb. And so I want to invite you today. God is inviting, He's looking for people that pledge their allegiance to the Lamb to be a pure of mind. Pure in what they read, hear, listen, watch. Pure in the way you dress. Ladies, Australia has a problem with dress. Has a problem with dress. The very first thing that you should see when you look at a lady is her eyes. If you see anything else first that draws your attraction, you're not dressed well. And just because everybody else does it doesn't make it right. We've got a big problem in the church. We've got to have reform in dress. We've got to have reform in our diet too. What we eat, what we drink, what we watch, what we eat. How can we be the bride of Christ when we eat, drink, watch, listen to what the world does? Can it be possible? Without spot or wrinkle. A pure bride. I'm sorry. We've, we've been committing fornication with the earth, with the world. And unfortunately, God's not going to seal anybody who's committing fornication. And we're not talking about salvation by works. We're talking about total surrender to God's way of doing things. It's God who gets the honor and glory. But we have to stop committing adultery with the earth. God's people playing with the earth. It cannot be. It's impossible. You will never receive this seal if this is the way it is. And so God invites us today to lay it all on the altar. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive us as a people. We have sinned against you, like Nehemiah said. As a people, my fathers have sinned against you. We have sinned. Me and my father's house. This is my confession today. Corporate confession. We have sinned against God. And so therefore, all we can do is confess and ask God to change us. Isn't that right? Would you like to be part of that? W would you kneel down with me right now as we lay our heart out before the Lord in confession and ask His Holy Spirit to take possession of His people today?
like Nehemiah, Lord. We kneel before you. Sister White said that Nehemiah's prayer is a prayer, a very special prayer. And when other prayers don't change the throne, that prayer will. It's a prayer of confession, first of all. We have sinned as a people. We have committed adultery with the world, bringing into the world, into our lives, and our private time, the things that have no place among God's people. The way we dress, 